Hello everyone, I'm so excited. It is the last day of the month and we are getting our top 20 out and putting them on eBay while you watch if you are a level 2 or 3 member. Otherwise we will premiere this and it will be a member only chat for everybody on all membership levels when we do that a few days after the early access begins for the level 2 and 3 members. We put the video out to everybody and everyone is welcome to watch and members are welcome to chat with us because we have some really fun and interesting things to show you. So let's get started because there's a whole pile and we're going to start with this little piece here something small but of interest and noteworthiness and partly because it's got a couple of labels on there this is Dryden pottery and Dryden was out originally out of Ellsworth Kansas they made this piece as an advertising piece for an attraction called the Big Well which is in another town in Kansas and is I believe the was the largest dug well in the world at the time and that time would have been around 1950. He was always interested in ceramics. He got drafted into the army in the Second World War and when he got out on the GI Bill he used it to go to the University of Kansas, study ceramics, and then came back and realized that Ellsworth had pretty good clay but it needed a little something and there was volcanic ash in the area and lending that to the mix made it a very good clay for pottery. And so that's why it says that it is a melody and glaze made of volcanic ash. On the bottom here you have some sort of an artist mark painted into the glaze for quality control. Uh, Dryden did a lot of vases and vessels and figural pieces the first 10 years in Kansas and then the interstate highway system started to be built and Kansas was the first state that got it. And lo and behold, Dryden Pottery was going to be bypassed. Ellsworth was going to be 30 miles off the freeway and he knew they couldn't survive so he moved to Hot Springs, Arkansas because that was a big tourist town in the region and Dryden Pottery is still a few generations later, a family-owned business in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Nowadays, there are some pieces they've made forever, but nowadays a lot of their stuff looks more like what I associate with 60s and 70s, lots of swirled glazes and modernist shapes. Uh, but in any event, it's fun that they lasted, and it's an interesting story. The first 10 years, the Kansas production is harder to find, and it is a feature in the Kansas Historical Museum. So there are collectors for this. We are starting this off at just $9.99 and we do have a buy it now. Uh, this month I will be traveling but some of these small items are small enough to come with me and so we are going to do uh, probably about half the listings in buy it nows so that people who see this early get a chance to get things that they really like. The next piece that we have here is <clears throat> One of two Fenton pieces we will be showing, and that is because I have two of just a few of what's left of this color. This color is Lotus Green Mist. It's Lotus Mist by Fenton, and it is a green Burmese, so that's why you see this pinkish color. This is a great pattern jar. They did a lot of these for QVC towards the end. It was one of their later colors, but they didn't make a whole lot of it. And because of that, a lot of collectors just don't encounter this. And the prices are high, even though it doesn't glow under a black light like custard glass does or the custard Burmese. It is still a very desirable color because collectors of Fenton know that it's really hard to get. Uh, this jar typically sells between about $70 and $80, so we're going to list it now and see how it does here. I will have one other piece that is a little different. This one is uh, rather unusual actually in that most of the pieces in this color are hand painted and decorated, whereas this one is a molded piece where that is the decoration. It's funny how things go in streaks when you're an antique buyer and reseller. I did an appraisal on a very large and rather sophisticated collection of old playing cards and then lo and behold I end up with a deck of old playing cards and these are of interest. You notice the poinsettias and the bell. That is a mission bell because these are California souvenir playing cards. This is from a time when Los Angeles has under 200,000 people. California is still considered pretty far out on the frontier. 
You see the copyright date of 1907 to 1909 by M. Ryder of Los Angeles, California. The box is in reasonable shape. The cards have been played with, but the important thing is they're all there, including the Joker and the blank. And this guy is actually considered the blank. A native son laughing it over while waiting for a tenderfoot. <laughs> the, it's definitely a different kind of California than we think of California now. Here's the old San Diego mission. Every card is a different scene. There's a lot of scenes of things that are not there anymore. Here's Avalon on Catalina Island, and Wrigley is just going to start building his casino. Yes, Wrigley of Chewing Gum fame, who also started the Catalina Island pottery out on Catalina Island. And so that scene changed very much in a very short period of time after this was done. So that's part of what's interesting about these old cards to people. Um, here's Moonlight at Venice. This is when Venice was a separate enclave from the city and just starting to form along canals. It was supposed to be a lot like the city of Venice. That was the original idea. It didn't turn out quite that way. Here's something that we marvel at now. Why would they celebrate 100,000 pigeons? But at the time, pigeons were actually not that common because they lived in rock cliffs. Then we started building skyscrapers and all of a sudden pigeons had a perfect natural habitat in the middle of all of our major cities and pigeons were not rare little doves anymore. This is the old U.S. Grant Hotel in San Diego. I know that one's still there. That's a historic monument. But I'm not sure that the old Paso Robles Spring or the Hotel Del Monte edifices still remain. So it's a really cool look at a place that has grown so very much in the slightly over 100 years since these were published. I think someone will get a charge out of looking at them and seeing how different things were than they are now, especially in urban California. So uh, these seem to be popular. They typically sell in a $25 to $30 range in this condition. And so we have a buy it now of $30 on it or it will start at $9.99 and we'll just see where it goes. One of the reasons I like doing these sales is because it gives us an idea of what the market is for certain things at a given point in time. I can certainly look at eBay completed sales and get a feel for what I think something might sell for, but it's all dependent on time and circumstance and who's in the market. So it's always fun and exciting to see what might pop, what might not sell for as much as you think, and kind of get a feel for where the trends are. Well, while we're in California, let's take a look at a California firm that spurred a Florida trend. How does that work? Well, it works when you are making ceramic flamingos, and we equate these with the 1950s, but the Will George Company, as marked on the bottom here, started out in Los Angeles in the mid-1930s, and bird figures were one of their big things. They moved to Pasadena, and then they moved to a third factory in San Gabriel. And I understand that's where the flamingos were made. It was their last factory. They came out with these around 1950 because in the post-war, a lot of people started moving to Florida. Air conditioning became more prevalent, and a lot of people had been stationed there in the war and liked it. And so they caught on to the idea that maybe flamingos would be popular. And boy, did they set something off. It started a craze for flamingos that ended up at its peak in 1957, when a fellow named Don Featherstone introduced the plastic pink flamingos that started to sprout up in American lawns all over. So flamingos have been with us for, gosh, 70 years now, and they are just cool. I have always really enjoyed them when I was a kid. We actually saw flamingos in Florida, which is not terribly common. And so I have just been a real fan of the flamingo ever since. And Will George was a very good company. And because these are American made in their earlier, I would not be surprised if this went somewhere between, oh, maybe um, uh, 85 and $125. But we're going to start it out at 49 and we're going to let the market find its way. Well, I'm so excited to have some childhood stuff. I ended up with an estate with a bunch of interesting things that are more, uh, well, 
from the youth of the past, and this certainly is something I remember seeing a lot in my youth, this is the Hot Wheels Thermos. Now, a lot of people think that lunchboxes and thermoses have kind of peaked in popularity and are not selling like they used to. And that's true of sort of garden variety ones. I sold a bunch off recently that sold for maybe $25 to $35, depending. But when you get into this era and it's something that was considered very cool that lots of people wanted, well, the prices are still pretty good on these. This, of course, is by the Thermos Company, Aladdin Products out of Nashville, Tennessee, who, yes, actually did make those Aladdin lamps back in the 30s so they morphed a lot to stay in business and thermos was a big deal for them they made glass inserts that was the original connection for the thermoses and as time went on of course they branded for all sorts of different companies well hot wheels came out in 1968 and they were a giant success uh, they were actually considered by most kids to be a little bit cooler than matchbox because look at that crazy race car well that's because they actually had a rocket scientist and a car designer help with the designs for hot wheels and the whole concept behind it. And one of the things they figured out is that kids would be really into these if the wheels rolled really fast. So they put these very thin and very easy to damage uh, wire axles in them, but that with the fatter wheels meant they were much faster than the English Matchbox cars, and that made them a big hit, and then they were able to make racetracks for them and make them really into something. So uh, a lot of people my age, Huge Hot Wheels fans, a lot of people my age collecting Hot Wheels now, and that's why this thermos in this condition, which is really very, very good, is worth somewhere in the $70 range. I am going to put it out, believe it or not, at $9.99, and we're going to let this go to where it should because I have confidence that it will find its way. What I'm seeing with other eBayers is that if they really feel confident in what they're selling, They'll just start it out at whatever and let it go where it needs to go. I mean, I look at uh, Crazy Lamp Lady and a lot of the stuff that she sells starts at $4. And the market tells it where it's supposed to be. Well, I mentioned Wrigley and the Catalina Island pottery. Catalina Island started around 1927, and they were one of the original ones that did the very, very vibrant glazes. But interestingly enough, another company started right at the same time that people really don't give as much heed, and they probably should because they made some pretty cool stuff. This is Tudor Potteries out of California. And this set has a particularly odd and interesting story behind it because it appears to have never been used. It has the original bare labels on all three pieces. And yet it does have a few little glaze misses around the edge here. Tudor Potteries was known primarily for making tile, and that's what they were best at. They made a lot of the tile in those little tile tables that are now very collectible, and people prefer the California-made tile, so the Tudor Company tiles are worth more. The really crazy thing is that the place it came from, they got it in the 1960s at the factory outlet for Metlock's Pottery. And why would this have been in Metlock's Pottery? Metlock's Pottery never owned Tudor Potteries. Tudor closed in 1939 after being bought by a company called California Arts. So there would seemingly have been no connection except Metlock's wanted to put out a line of really bright dinnerware. And it would make perfect sense to me that they would have bought pieces from their potential competitors. Vernon Kilns was right down the street from Tudor. They would have had Bauer Pottery up the street. They would have had Catalina out on the island. It would have been very easy for them to get various pieces together so they could figure out how to do their glaze for their first really big successful line, which was Metlock's Poppy Trail Line 200, which came out around the time that Tudor Potteries was being bought out in 1934. So coincidence, I kind of don't think so. I actually think this has a really interesting heritage to it. Anyway, they bought it at the factory outlet in the 1960s. It's been in the family ever since. It's never been used and it is basically new old stock that is now 90 years old. What a cute little set. I just love the color. Perfect for fall, and we are going to start this one again at $49. I'm hopeful and would like to believe that the value is probably twice that. So hopefully somebody who really understands California pottery gets a look at this and understands how neat it is. I am 
old enough to remember when these were a Christmas stocking novelty about 1981. <clears throat> these are called popovers. In the 70s and early 80s, it was very popular to buy these little wind-up walkers. They were made with very inexpensive motors, and they would hop around or crawl around or walk around sometimes. Uh, but these have never been used, and that's what's different about them. These are by Tomy, and Tomy was a Japanese company, originally the Tomiyama Toy Company in the 1940s. Well, it went on for about three generations, and in the 70s and early 80s, they were known for making cute, fun little toys that appealed to, uh, well, you know, gift buyers and younger children and that sort of thing. Here's the backs of these that show you that we have all three of them in the set, by the way. The monkey, the kangaroo, and the mouse. So Toby was making all sorts of cute little toys like this when the great-grandson of the founder looked at his dad, who was then running the company in the 1980s, and said, your toys are boring. I want to work for Bondi when I grow up. And that did not go over well, but Dad had to figure out why, and pretty soon Tomy was doing things related to anime, and they got involved with Pokemon because Bondi was doing really well with other things and didn't want it and passed on Pokemon. All of a sudden, Tomy was a huge deal. So this is the ancestor of Pokemon, believe it or not. <laughs> the people who collect these really loves having them in the original box. It's got the original $1.39 price tag. Uh, these usually sell for about $30 a piece sealed. I'm going to do a buy it now of $75 on the three, but we're starting them at just $9.99, so maybe somebody will get a great bargain. Well, I know this month must seem like a lot of really fun pop culture stuff and not exactly what I usually do, but that just depends sometimes on what you find. Last couple of months I've been showing things like early European porcelains. Well, this time we have the 1983 Stray Cats album. <laughs> so, yes indeed, 40 years ago. Can you believe that Brian Setzer, look how young he looked 40 years ago. He and his band were really, really successful. They started in London, they got popular, they got a couple of contracts over in the U.S., and this was for their third album, which in the U.S. was their second album, and it is the release, the promotional album, with this funny cutout and the picture disc for Looking Better Every Beer. On the other side is the song that actually ended up being the hit from that album, She's Sexy and Seventeen. And that was their last big hit because Brian Setzer made what he later admitted was a huge mistake and said, well, I'm getting bored of the band and rockabilly is lots of fun, but I want to do other things with other people and explore music. And so he broke the band up and ended up eventually reforming with one of the members in the Brian Setzer Orchestra and made a comeback in the early 90s and is still performing today. Uh, so things turned out all right, but yes, they were really a phenomenon when this came out in 1983. The era of 50s nostalgia, rockabilly uh, dancing started to become a fad and people would dress up and they'd want to go out and lick the part and dance the part and have that kind of music, and so uh, this definitely fit the bill. It's interesting because it's a cutout, it's interesting because it's a picture disc, and these are not actually super common to find. I am starting it at $9.99. I have a buy it now of $25, which is about where they typically sell. I'm putting up a little jewelry. I haven't done much jewelry the last few months because, well, it's been summer, and summer was not jewelry season historically. But now we're getting into jewelry wearing season, and the first items I want to show you are these because they have a good brand name, and wow, are they sparkly. Look at those big Rivoli stones. Really good quality rhinestones were the hallmark of this particular maker. And the maker name on the back is Von Dome, V-E-N-D-O-M-E. -E. Now, Von Dome is an area in Paris that is considered to be very fashionable. And that is what these earrings were named for. They came out at the same time as the Francois line. So are they French? Why, no. These were actually Coros upscale lines. Von Dome started in 1944 and replaced the Coro Craft line, which did the duet pieces and those amazing pins and stuff. They became the high-end line for Coro, and then the rest of Coro went to a more middle market strategy. So 
These are really good quality. These were made about 1970 and were designed by a woman named Helen Marion, who was their designer in that time. They did them in various colors. I like the high contrast of the black and white with this particular purpley gold stone. And they're just really showy. In 1970, about the time these were made, strangely enough, the Coro Industries, all of the jewelry making, was sold to Kitta Incorporated, which makes firefighting equipment. How a firefighting company and a jewelry company were going to merge and do well together is anybody's guess, but it didn't work. And within 10 years, Cora was no more, and neither was Von Dome. So these are really from right at the peak of the production, and they're just very pretty. I suspect they should sell for $45 to $50, perhaps a little more. We're going to start them at $29. We will have a buy it now of $49 if someone just loves them. This next lot is a lot, and there's a lot to it, and I think it's rather interesting, and they do sell, so I'm curious to see how this will do. It's a lot of five items, and they all have to do with this. WISC, the Weschler Institute, and this outfit tests children for their intelligence. And they do that by using tests that children can do and measure the speed with which they can do them. So this is called an object assembly test. I love that it says it's by the Psychological Corporation. I think just that name right there is worth it. <laughs> A little disarming, perhaps. But then you see that, oh, this one is a horse. And the next one is mom, which is why it says M on the side of the box. They're each uh, coded with a letter. So H is for horse, M is for mom. Uh, we've got A, oh, I like this one. A is for automobile. And you can tell by the automobile that we're looking sometime in the 1950s, because that looks like about a 1940 car there. And then we have, well, this is a little Picasso-esque looking, but it's supposed to be a face. And then the other part, which I think is really fun and could be a lot of fun to play with or do something with graphically, are these. And this is the box that says it is picture arrangement. And what the kid is supposed to do is they'll take out, I have one that I unbundled so I can show you. So this one is called Sleeper. And Sleeper does not want to get out of bed. So what they do is they give the kids these cards and tell them to arrange it in the order of the story. Well, he may not want to get out of bed, but his wife is definitely ready for him to go to work and get out of her way. And so she makes him get up. He's wolfing down his breakfast and she's pointing at the clock and saying, get out of here, dude. And then he is on his way in a wild, sweaty tear so that he can get to work and Go back to sleep. Isn't that nice? Well, that's a great message for a child to see. <laughs> In any event, uh, this was how they tested kids' intelligence. So there's about a dozen different categories going on a picnic, the gardener, rain, a burglar, mother, taking the train, because this is around the early 50s, and you still took the train a lot of places. Anyhow, it's an interesting bunch of stuff, I think. I'm just going to start it out at $9.99 for the lot. I've seen lots of just the four of these sell for about $25 to $30. I have seen one of these sell for about the same, so potentially this could go for $40 or $50. But we'll see. I just think it'll be interesting to find out who thinks this sort of thing is neat, like I do. And you can find out if you're smarter than a fourth grader. Well, I've got one more lunchbox and thermos, and then I will have pretty much cleared out this great collection that I got. But here it is. I saved the best for last as far as this goes. I had one lunchbox we put up last month, but this one is Star Wars. And it is from a galaxy far, far away in a time that is far, far away, 19... 77. This is an original one. You can see it's got a little bit of surface wear, just a few very, very minor dents uh, from normal use, but it's very clean. It does not seem to have any big chips or dents. It does have a thermos. The thermos is not in very good condition, which is odd because I don't think this was used much, but I suspect that when the kid grew up that they stored this in the attic and that the heat split the thermos because this is just about the time that 
they are starting to experiment with putting the plastic thermoses in instead of the old metal ones with the glass liners. Kids did not really like the plastic thermoses, as I recall, but it was cheaper and lighter, and that's what they did. Uh, I think some of the later boxes, they actually went back to metal because there were complaints about it. So I think there's a transition period where there's both. In any event, the great thing about this is the subject matter. Star Wars is so collectible right now, as you can imagine, it's been gosh, 46 years now since the movie came out, and that is definitely long enough that you have several generations collecting this sort of thing by now. I believe that the value of this in this condition is probably upwards of $150. We'll see whether we get all or part of that because we're going to put it on auction. And again, we're going to do it very inexpensively. We're going to start it at $9.99, no reserve. I'm not fooling around this time, folks. We are going to get bids on these items. Uh, we've been pretty successful getting bids on items of late, and so I figure let's just go right for a price that everybody can imagine and take it from there and see where it goes. This is something that a friend of mine and I went in on at the Springfield Antique Show in Ohio because we saw three of these and we thought they were pretty interesting. It is a Craftmaster set, but this is the watercolor set. It's obviously very 60s. It's Space Shot. And it's like we are blasting off to the moon. It's a pretty neat piece, I think, and it has never been out of the wrap. It has never been used. It's got good color. Why did we buy these? Well, we thought the graphics were cool. They were, I think we paid $15 a piece. I'll just say right out there, we got three, two like this and one that's a different cover. And we saw completed sales for their paint by number kits and the paint by numbers go really high. The watercolor sets, we could not find anything that looked like this. The watercolor sets that had sold were all selling for $30 and $40, and they were really rather bland and had flowers or little cottages on them, no great graphics. But the paint by numbers with interesting graphics were selling for three digits. So we decided to take a chance on this because we just want to see again what the market is, and we have the chance to sell one online, test the market, and then have another one left to sell. So that's exactly what we're going to do right now. And while we're on the rocket attack here, I thought that we should go ahead and show this one because this one is an example of something I've talked about for years. People say, well, the old things are better because they're better quality and they stood the test of time. And I say that is not always why things are valuable. Sometimes things are valued because they were really poor quality and they stood the test of time. And this is a great example of something that was not made to last 60 years, but it has. This is by the Fred Roberts Company, or at least it was designed by them and made in Japan. And you see their label right there, Fred Roberts. I believe they were out of San Francisco. They were known in later years for tiki mugs and some pretty cool stuff. But in the late 50s and early 60s, they were just starting out and the cheapest thing to import was Japanese redware. And when I say redware, look at the color of the clay under that silver paint there, and you'll see it's like a reddish brown. Redware was used because it was lighter weight, it was cheaper to make, it didn't have to be fired as high, and it was not as sturdy and would not hold up as well. Then they decided to screen paint for your trip to the moon and they screen painted the stars. They cold painted the red and the yellow on the bottom for the flames coming out the bottom as it launches. They cold painted all the silver. Cold painting means that you paint directly on this glossy surface. That means it's not really cured very well. It means that it's pretty likely that this paint will rub off. They did a whole line of shot glasses in this, and if you let like uh, Everclear or vodka go down the side of the shot glass, you will see a line and the paint will disappear where the line is, which is why even though their shot glasses are really cute, they had a set of eight in a box that were various um, shots like big shot and little shot and half shot and a bunch of stuff like that. And they were all little figures, but they get ruined really easily. So 
That is why this bank does not appear anywhere that I can find. I have not seen it on eBay. I have not seen it in any listings anywhere in the recent time that I've had it. And I've been looking pretty consistently for a couple of months. So I've decided it's time to put it on because rocket banks are pretty popular. And especially when they have the look of the Apollo mission, this was just when rockets were starting to be conceived of as looking like this rather than the Buck Rogers model. So it's a pretty cool piece. Rather predictive, actually, I would say. And this one is starting again at only $9.99. I'm not doing a buy it now on this. This is one where I really want to see what people think of it and who the ultimate collector is and what they think it's worth because I just think this is a scarce and interesting thing. It's certainly the kind of thing I sell in Florida, but we're a little ways from our shows in Florida, so I'm just going to put it out for everybody. Well, while we're on the subject of Japanese import ceramics, the Fred Roberts of the world got things started in the 50s and 60s, and by the late 70s and early 80s, it was time for a new generation of ceramics to come over from Japan. Ceramic making got better in Japan, the quality got better, and so more and more American designers started to factor out to Japan, including a designer by the name of David L. Page, and I'm giving him great gravitas, even though very little is known about him, except that he came up with this marvelous product here and it is the sperm bank. Sometimes they have eyes on the front. I believe the earlier ones may be the ones that did not. They came in a box that told you very, very important things about the sperm bank, like to make sure you made nightly deposits and to make sure you kept it in a moist and damp place and to make sure that you understood that there are substantial penalties for early withdrawals. Yes, it was all full of very dirty double entendre puns because this came out in 1981. And 1981, we think of the dark days of disco and sort of a notion of 70s hedonism, but really 1981 was the peak because 1981 was also the year that unfortunately a new disease was discovered. And all of a sudden, well, being cute and funny about sex, well, it suddenly took a pretty serious turn. And because of that, the sperm bank only lasted on the market for about three or four years, but it was sold through Spencer Gifts, and that is why you see them around now. Originally, it would have had a Japan mark in a paper label, white on blue, in a rectangle. It's just the silliest thing. And I have to admit, I think I bought someone one as a gag gift from Spencer Gifts, which is where they were sold back in the day. And now I have another one. So I'm sure my mother would be proud. In any event, someone will have fun with this. And we are starting this also at $9.99. It should sell for about $20 to $25. With all the interest in turquoise jewelry, it is becoming harder and harder to find at affordable prices for resale, but I was very happy to pick these up because these are turquoise enamel on copper, and they are by the Matisse Company. And Matisse was a big name in jewelry in the 1950s and early 60s. There was the Renoir and the Matisse Company both. You notice that Coro named Vendôme after a French area. Well, these folks who were the same folks who ended up being involved in Curtis Jure metal sculpture, they came up with the idea of calling them Matisse and Renoir because French fashion was where it was at in the 1950s. And so you wanted a French sounding name, even though these were definitely made in the United States and they were made using a process where very similar to some of the trays that we see, you would fire the enamel onto the copper. It says, do not polish because the exclusive Capron process ensures Matisse jewelry against tarnish and marks. And actually, that's pretty true because these are now 60 years old and yet they have never been off of the card. These are new old stock. They have never actually been worn from what I can tell. And it's so amazing to me that it has the original sales card. I believe that these, if you have the other pieces in the set, might be worth $25 or $30 to a person. I'm putting them out at $9.99 and a buy it now of $29. Well, this is a bit of a departure, but this came to me in a stack of ephemera recently, and I thought it was really interesting because I grew up around this stuff to a certain extent, and yet I had never seen one of these. 
This is from World War II, and you know World War II because it says the War Department, not the Department of Defense. They did not rename it as the Defense Department until after the Second World War. This is the Department of the Navy because this is all about recognizing naval vessels of different countries around the world. And when you open it up, the sleeve's a little battered, but this is in really good shape, and it is marked Restricted. Restricted meant that only a handful of people were supposed to have this book and have access to it. It was not for everybody. It's actually, when we talk about things like classified documents and stuff, I mean, if you were not the person who was supposed to have this and you got a hold of it and they found out, you would have been in serious trouble back then. I think the interesting part to me, of course, is that it shows not only all the silhouettes so that you could memorize them and hopefully be able to tell them at a distance in the ocean. My dad was on the USS Wilsey, which is a destroyer, one of these little ships here. They ended up going to Korea. They don't show the names of every ship of its type, but they do show pictures of the different classes. And here's a bunch of battleships. Having grown up in a lot of Navy towns, I saw all of these in port everywhere we lived. But then they get into the silhouettes so that you can learn everything you need to know to identify at a distance the enemy. So we have Japanese vessels, we have German vessels, and they have great details on where the armaments are and all of the things you would need to know to attack. So this is a pretty serious war document. It's not that these are super scarce, but I haven't seen a lot of them around. And like I said, I've lived in Navy towns, so this was not something that was really intended to get out to the public too much. And that's why these are actually pretty desirable now. Again, we're starting at $9.99 on this piece, but they typically sell for about $45 because there are so many World War II buffs. If you remember the show Mad Men, of course, they were always talking about all the advertising they were doing for all of the products and all of the things that they would have to invent. And a company in 1961 called Leo Burnett was doing that in real life. And one of the things they came up with was this guy. This is Charlie the Tuna. And Charlie the Tuna was drawn by the DePatie Freeling, and that's Fritz Freeling of the old Looney Tunes fame. That is the company that actually did the Pink Panther cartoons as well. And so they came up with Charlie the Tuna. And Charlie the Tuna was based on Henry Nemo. And Henry Nemo had been a jazz musician and was a bit of a jive talker and a hipster. And so they made Charlie the Tuna a beret-wearing hipster who would walk around with his glasses and be very Hollywood and talk about how important it was that he get to be in Starkist Tuna because he was fabulous. Well, he was never fabulous enough because they would always say, sorry, Charlie, we only put pure tuna in Starkist Tuna, and that was the big joke. One of the most recognized advertising characters in history. They tried to retire him in the 1980s. By the 1990s, they were using him again because he was so popular that people were requesting him and complaining that he wasn't there and their sales fell and they decided that they should just keep on with the good thing. So Charlie the Tuna will probably last for a while longer. These little money clip slash pocket knives, like the one that he's on here, were popular in the early 1970s as advertising gimmicks. This particular one has a Japanese mark on it. Some of these were made by Zippo. And the Zippo ones are a little easier to open, I have to admit. <laughs> but there we go. So it's got two blades on either, uh, one on either side, and nice enameling, and it's not damaged. It's in nice condition. Be fun just to have as a novelty. There are people who collect Charlie Tuna. They made a lot of premiums that you would send off for, especially in the 70s, including this. So uh, we are starting this once more. Say it again, together, $9.99 is our starting price on this. But this one I would think would maybe get up in the range of maybe $30 or $35. If the right people see it, it could go as high as $50. So we'll take a chance and put it out right now. We talked a little before about how important Hot Wheels were to Mattel's fortunes. But by the mid-70s, Mattel's fortunes had gone south. The early 70s recession had really hit them hard. There were a lot of new rules about advertising on television to children, and they were having trouble coping. And the two original founders got into financial trouble and started cooking the books, were found out and were drummed out of the company. 
And the new management was desperate to do something to turn the company around. And so they started with the idea that, well, Hot Wheels could be premiums that we put in other company stuff. So they made a deal with a soap company. They were going to put the original VW, and yes, it's a red line because they were still making red lines at this point, in boxes of soap. Well, that deal fell through. And in the meantime, to make them cheaper, they had made this particular one with plastic bottoms. So they could not package them and sell them as regular Hot Wheels. So they sat around the warehouse for about five years. And after red lines were no longer being made, they sold the whole bunch to a company called Wisconsin Toy Company. And their mark is right here. And Wisconsin Toy took all the rest of these, bagged them up, and sold them in these little bags. And this is why it does not look like your usual Hot Wheels package. And it's why it does not have your usual Hot Wheels metal bottom from the first generation that you would have expected. That makes this a strange variety that people collect now. And because of that, this little piece in the original packaging should sell for around $50. Again, we're going to start it at $9.99, so I think people are going to have a lot of fun looking at all of this childhood stuff and sending it to where it should go. Our penultimate piece tonight is another wonderful piece of jewelry, and this is a fox. This fox is foxy, all right. This is by Leah Stein. Leah Stein is a very interesting person. She is still alive. She is from Paris, and she got into the fashion industry in the 1950s. By the mid-60s, she and her husband, who was a chemist, came up with an idea to use essentially celluloid in layers and more layers and more layers to make these really interesting mottled and multi-layered pieces of jewelry, largely in whimsical shapes like animals. She is probably one of the most influential plastic jewelry makers of the 20th century, and a lot of her stuff reminds you of things that were done earlier by companies in the Second World War period. You see the signature on here that says Leah Stein. You also see it looks like this has been heat fused into the plastic. There is a myth out there that that tells you that this is an older piece and that later on they glued them. That has actually not been proven. So uh, that's a good example of something that one group of collectors swears by and another group of people who say they're in the know says never happened. So I would say that you really want to study these pieces to know newer from older. I believe this one is from the second generation that started about 1990. The first generation went up until the early 1980s and then they were reintroduced. And I believe this is an early piece from the reintroduction period because the person I got it from used to buy these new and she told me that that was what it was and I believe her. It's a really fun piece in any event. The design is just really great. Look at those eyes. Look at the stretch. It would be so fun down the front of the uh, blouse. And it is going to, again, we're going to give it a chance and start it at $9.99. But really, these should sell, and I have a buy it now on it, at $125. We'll see if it goes to bid, whether it gets to that level. But that is the typical selling price for these. So Leah Stein, definitely something to look for. Don't just think that, oh, well, it's plastic, so how good could it be? It could be pretty good. This is our last piece. It is one of the last pieces of Fenton Green Lotus we have from the collection that we got recently, and it is one of the prettier pieces they did because it has the very delicate painting of the hummingbird at the flowers on it. It has the Fenton sticker up here. It has the marks on the bottom indicating that it was uh, painted by D. Robinson, who's considered one of the better painters, and it also has one of the Fenton family signatures on it. And so this is going to be a piece that was made about 20 years ago, and that's because the Green Lotus Mist or the Green Burmese was not something that was in the Fenton line for very long. It was hard for them to make Burmese as it was. It was even more difficult to make blue Burmese, and then they come up with the green. So it's a really beautiful color, and when I get it, it sells very quickly, and the prices are really very good on these pieces. And so, so this one, again, we're starting at a very, very low price, and we are going to let the market bid it up to what it should sell for. I have a pretty good idea what that is. 
And I'm curious to see if the market and I agree. So far, I have to say every piece of Fenton I've put on recently that was unusual like this has sold for more than I expected. So I am going to send this one off to somebody, I'm sure. And the same with all these other pieces. In the meantime, I'll give you a nice send off and say thank you so much. Particularly thank you to the members whose extra contributions help make this possible. And especially to the people who follow the bids, purchase items if you enjoy them. It all definitely contributes and helps because then we can go out and find more interesting things to bring you the next time. Isn't that a nice arrangement? <laughs> I, I think we all have fun with this and I certainly have fun bringing it to you and doing a little deeper dive on these items. This was a lot of fun stuff this month, and who knows, next month could be fun, could be serious, could be a combination of both. You just never know what I'm going to find when I'm out there, but I will bring it to you, and we'll have fun seeing how it does in the online world.